you know, come on. I want to you to have a, have a moment where you're at, wherein you can be clear in your expectation. You know, because sometimes we come in to the presence of God not without an expectation but without a definite expectation you know because there are times where it's just like your system is in the routine this is what we do on Tuesdays I'm gonna just show up this is what's going on and I will just be there you know but every now and again things happen to let us know that every moment and every appointment has the potential to become an encounter. And I'm going to say that again. Every single appointment that we have with God and with God's people has every potential to become an encounter. You know, because there's one thing about having appointments and just having meetings for having meetings sake. You look at the Old Testament and in the time of the Exodus, the elders would sometimes gather together in the tent of meeting and it was going to be a meeting. However, there are instances wherein they had an encounter with the Shekinah glory of God, wherein the cloud of glory will be so intense that it becomes palpable. People can actually see it. And so I want you to have such an expectation tonight that this meeting has the same potential because Jesus made a promise to us. He said, wherever two or three of you are gathered in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. And I want to believe that there are at least two people who are here tonight in the name of the Lord. Come on. You know, praise the Lord. Because if the food had been delivered as promised and you're still here, you know, one could say, well, you're here for the food. But the food was not delivered in, in its completion and you're still here. Perhaps you may be here for more than just the pizza. And I just want to thank God for you because of the fact that this is not as common as we would like for it to be, which is to have people gather in his name. You know, and the apostle prophesied in the, in the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25, saying, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves especially as you see the day approaching. Because that will become the manner of some. I mean, look at that. He says that will become customary to some people. That's just going to become some people. They just don't fellowship anymore. And then they have all kinds of reasons. Oh, someone hurt me and I don't like the music. I don't like the food. I don't like the air conditioning. I don't like, you know, that sister that is always like everybody's friend, but for some reason I just can't be friends with her. You know, her light is too sh is shining too bright. You know, people make up all kinds of reasons. Whereas the word of God says you are inexcusable. We, we cannot continue to give excuses, excuses. Because Jesus says each one of us will stand on his own and give an account. And when that time comes for you to give an account, you're not going to say, well, Jesus, that stuff you're asking me about, I need to call Antoine. Let him come and tell you what he did. You understand what I mean? No, that's not going to happen. Each one of us will stand and give an account. Simply because he has endowed you with all of what you need to succeed in the race that he has called you to. And let me tell you something, folks. It becomes the manner of some people. Oh, I like that scripture. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. You know this scripture that we like to quote a lot, that, oh, every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. We like to quote that scripture as a show of authority and force and say, oh, at the name of Jesus. But the reality of it is when the prophet Isaiah, I believe it was, said that, that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. He wasn't talking about the fact that they're going to bow to your authority. He says that every tongue shall confess before the Lord what they have done with what he gave them. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. You would have to stand and testify. That is the reason why it is not worth it to let someone else be 
the motivation or demotivation of your actions when it comes to the things of God. You need to be able to stand on your own. You know, these are the last days. Jesus said to the woman by the well, she said, a time is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Wherein it's no longer going to be, hallelujah, it's not going to be by what everybody else is doing. Jesus told the lady, she says, we are canceling religion. Oh, religion is now canceled. Oh, yes. Because of the fact that the woman was so prideful in her religion. And Jesus was like, wow, what is religion? Why are you holding on to religion? You see, religion is what is put in place to compel people to do what has been deemed or what is deemed to be right. But God says, I have been there. I have done that. I have given you laws and the laws were meant to constrain you and to guide you. He said, but I'm not looking for people who are doing it just because they were told to do it. I'm not looking for people who are doing it as a religious obligation. I'm looking for those who would choose from their own belly to seek the Lord because the Bible says, for the Father seeks such. And so Jesus told the woman, your time is coming wherein you would not have to observe the rituals. But it's just going to be the truth that you believe. The truth that you know. You see, a friend of mine sent me a post earlier. It might have been yesterday or earlier today. And the post was a video of a lady who was talking about a book that she found. Um, and it was found at one of these very popular bookstores. I'm not going to say their name. That will be free publicity, and they're not getting that out of me today. She said, but the book was placed at the very bottom of the shelf so children can reach the book, and it's supposed to be a children's book teaching children how to take ownership of their own bodies. And the word parent was not even in the book. They were calling parents your grown-ups. So basically exposing the children to a larger pool of grown-ups who may not be as well-meaning, who may not have been given that authority by God to be custodians of these innocent souls. And a lot of what they were talking about was the title of the book, I don't remember, but the, 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 the caption on the back of the book says, introducing the fundamentals of consent. And so they were telling the children that their bodies were theirs, that they can choose to do whatever they want that they can even choose to use their body for their own pleasure. And so this lady was not very happy with what was going on. And the person who sent it to me, of course, wasn't happy. And that's why he sent it to me, that look at what's become of the world. And when I saw the post, my heart was leaping for joy. And so I replied to him. I said, well, praise the Lord for where we have come to. We have come to a time wherein the walls are broken down. So if we find anyone now in the path of righteousness, it is not because religion exists to compel them. It is because they have chosen the Lord. I said to my friend, I said, isn't it exciting to know that many people who may have outsourced the responsibility of training children to the system are now taking back the responsibility because it is not the responsibility of any government or any organization to raise your children. The Lord said to you, the parent, train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is grown, he will not depart from it. But we have neglected our position and we have allowed other people to train our children because of convenience. But now that we're beginning to see that they are not for us, but that they are against us, many are beginning to wake up to say, you know what, okay, hold on. I'm no longer confident in what they may be teaching at that school. Even though I know some of the teachers there are filled with the Holy Ghost and they mean well, but in a lot of ways their hands are tied because the system is Sodom and the regimentation is Egypt. So we need to use that which the Lord has given unto us in this revival of, Ob of Obed-Edom to bring once again the glory to the house. For those who don't know the revival of Obed-Edom, Obed-Edom was a man in whose house the presence of God found a place. 
They tried taking the Ark of the Covenant everywhere after he had been recovered from the enemy nation. But they couldn't find a place for it because the presence of God just wouldn't rest anywhere until they found the house of this man whose name was called Obed-Edom. Alan was sharing with us the wonderful prophetic meanings of the names of Obed-Edom's children. But Obed-Edom himself, his name means the one who is ready to serve others. Obed means servant, Edom means man. Edom is the same word, Adam. And so, many of us, we have stopped being Obed-Edom. We have stopped serving the ones that God has committed into our care. We just want to go to some job, get enough money to have a good time and pay everybody else to do everything else. We can no longer outsource that which is our primary responsibility simply because no one can do it like you. Because you are unique before the Lord and he has called you for a specific assignment that you're not supposed to do by mammon. You're supposed to do it with all your heart. And so we are in exciting times, but we have to be able to see it that way. You see what I'm saying? We have to be able to see it that way because if we are still in those times wherein it is the government that is telling people who to marry and who not to marry, how would we regard the word of God above all else? But right now that these agents of God's judgment, the seraphim, now that they have come, you see, the, the, you know, I've been telling you for a while now that the, the responsibility or the task of separating the wheat from the tears cannot be left to people. We're not that good yet. You understand what I'm saying? Because we are still quite partial and we are sentimental because we have this carnal flesh. And, and so Jesus says, the master said to his servants, don't worry about separating the tears from the wheat. When the time comes, my father will send the reapers and they will separate the wheat from the tears and they will gather the tears, they will burn the tears and then gather the wheat into the barn. And so that's the reason why the Lord's been impressing upon our hearts through the ministry of remembrance that we cannot speak evil of dignitaries because some of the people that you read about in the papers, some of the people you see on the news who appear to be evil and against you are actually working for you. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. They may say the darndest things, they lie through their teeth, but the reality of it is for them to be as convincing as they are, it takes power. That's why the Bible says power was given to the dragon, that serpent of old, the adversary. Just making sure that you know that God is talking about the same shape-shifting serpent. That he will receive power to deceive the nations, but he will not keep the power to himself. It will, it will pour out of his own spirit upon his messengers. You see, the Bible says that Satan would disguise himself as an angel of light and so will his messengers because Satan is following God's blueprint. Jesus says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams and your daughters, the maidens, will prophesy. Now, if there will be a false prophet that will usher in the ministry of the Antichrist, then definitely that prophet needs to operate with some kind of unction. And one of the very evidences that we have of where such power comes from is in the story of Absalom and his seer council that is called Haitophel. Haitophel was a gifted man, but he was still a man. But his gifting was so unique and so special. Like I, was, like I reminded us, I believe it was on Tuesday or Saturday, that for his counsel to be defeated, the Bible says God had to release a lying spirit from his presence. The Bible says a lying spirit departed from the presence of God. After God had given him an instruction of what to do, God told the lying spirit, you know what to do. Go and possess the other counselors of the king. We know those ones are real, really they are goons. They cannot convince anyone of anything. They need power. And in the last days, for the battle that is called Armageddon to be fair, the other side also has to be empowered. And so the way God empowers 
anyone or any situation is by sending his own people that he can trust. People that he has equipped for the assignment. Look at how the children of Israel thought that Pharaoh was the enemy. <laughs> but God said, Egypt, my son. God said, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. God said, Cyrus, my beloved. Now you're wondering, all these people, God is saying that they're from him and that they're his people, but they were tormenting the people of God. And God is like, yes, because if they do not do it, how will my children be strong? How will they know to choose between good and evil? I cannot trust somebody that I do not know to set up the fire with which I want to try my children. I send my own burning ones. You may not like what they look like. They may be doing things that you consider treacherous and evil, like the lying spirit, like the angel of death. Do you know that the angel of death that came and killed all the firstborn in Egypt was called the angel of the Lord? <laughs> the Bible says, and the angel of the Lord, the angel of death. <laughs> so why am I saying what I am saying? I am saying it because I want you to know the time that we're in and the reason why God is going through all of this trouble. Because some of those beings are not the easiest to deal with. Just imagine if you send a lying spirit on assignment. How can you even be sure of the report that it brings to you? For crying out loud is a lying spirit. Do you know that God said to Moses, he said, the road ahead is kind of rough. Just this wilderness is treacherous. He said, so I have sent my angel ahead of you. He said, but this angel that I have sent ahead of you is my angel, but to be honest, he doesn't forgive. He is so mean and so brutal that you cannot cross him. I'm the one sending him to go ahead of you but try and stay out of his way simply because for him to do his assignment, I had to design him in a certain way. You want to have a beautiful lawn, you must be ready to have a sharp blade. And that blade does not care whether you paid for it at Lowe's or you borrowed it from Home Depot. If your tiny fingers are in the way of the blade, it will slice it off like a little carrot on your chalkboard. Yes, even though you paid for it. How many times have you paid for things that hurt you? Oh, oh. One time, too many. Oh, yes. Our, our people have a saying that if you pay to be spun, then you must be ready to be dizzy. Because if you pay for someone to spin you around, Make sure you get your money's worth. Be dizzy to the point wherein you pass out. And then you know that, yes, I got value for money. And that is what happens when God sends out these people. He sends them out because it takes certain qualities to get the job done. It's God knows that he may not be able to send Antoine to be a lying politician because Antoine has a pure heart. And it's like, okay, this one is righteous. But I need wickedness to be done. So the Bible says the Lord prepares the wicked for the day of doom. And for those people who were not here last week, don't feel bad for people who are doing wickedly by saying, well, God was the one who chose them. He was like, okay, I need wicked people. One, two, three, four, be wicked. No, God is an author. He writes the script you audition for the part you want to play. He's giving you the choice. He said, I set before you this day, life and death. Choose life that you may live. Sister Z reminded me today that Judas was called by Jesus a friend. Peter, Jesus called an adversary when they were in preparation. But when the time of examination came, Judas chose to be the son of perdition. And Peter chose to humble himself before the Lord and repent. The Lord writes the script. What role are you auditioning for? 
And so, I don't know where or when these guys auditioned for whatever part they're playing, but one thing that I've told you and I've told you repeatedly is that they are not all people. The revival of the time of Noah was started by an angel. He has such a long name, I can't, I've, I've tried to memorize that name. He's something like Ayasli Riolor. It's such a long name. He was the one who started to preach in the time of Enoch by first of all making the disciple of one man. The Bible says, and the Lord said to his angel, he says, now you will go to the son of Lamech and you will tell him of the things to come and tell him to prepare himself and to prepare the ark. And when the angel of the Lord was leaving, God was like, where do you think you're going? Looking like that. Who knows what he looked like? He was probably fire. Because the Bible says the Lord makes his angels wind and his messengers, he made them fire. And so God said to him, come back. He says, do not go looking like that. He says, cover yourself, cloak yourself, shift into another shape. And when you get there, don't tell him that long name of yours that nobody knows. The Lord said to him, just say you are from me. So when he came, he probably came looking like a man. And he says, Noah, do you have a moment? Can you step outside with me? I need to talk to you. Noah must have thought that he was dealing with a man. But that's why the Bible says, be kind to strangers. For by so doing, some people have unwittingly entertained angels. I cannot say this enough. I know that I've been repeating myself. But what I am telling you about requires such precision. Because the guys who have come, they're called reapers because they have come with a surgical blade to carry out these harvests. And that is the reason why you cannot afford to be one inch outside on the street because the angel of the Lord, the angel of death, has only one instruction. Escape the ones behind the seal. So for you to know how to maintain your boundary, you have to be behind the seal. I'm going to tell you again that these things have happened before. All right? These things have happened before. And a good example in the past was the example of Balaam. Remember Balaam? When Balaam was first introduced to us, what did he look like? For those of you who may not have read your Bible since the spring of 86, I will remind you of the story. Balaam was introduced to us as a sorcerer. He was someone who had magical powers. Balak went to meet him. Balak was a king who hated the children of God. He hated the children of Israel. And why did he hate them? He said, because their God is so powerful, we cannot even allow for them to be this close to us. Because we have heard that the one who is with them is able to possess any land and give it to them. Does that sound familiar? The reason why the enemy is against you, who is the light of the world and salt of the earth, is because you are to inherit the earth. And in envy and hot jealousy, the ones who have lost their place in heaven, remember that the thought of the angels in heaven being led by Lucifer were kicked out of heaven and the Bible says their place was no more. Where did they go? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the adversary is fallen. Where did they go? They had nowhere else to go. That is the basis of all the alien movies that you see. They have destroyed their planet. They're looking for someone else, somewhere else. And in every one of those movies, they are looking to come to earth because there is nowhere else. The Bible says in the beginning, God created only two places, the heavens and the earth. So if you are kicked out of heaven, you have only one other option, to come to the earth. Someone says, what about hell? Hell is the, what hell used to be the basement of the earth. That's why it's called Sheol, the underground of the earth. is still part of the earth. And that's the reason why it was prophesied that the Son of God will be in the belly of the ground. Not in another dimension. Not in another... It is still the... God created the heavens and the earth. And that is the reason why Satan and his cohorts have been looking to disqualify us so that perhaps God can now say, well, since man is not able to hold on to that which we gave to him, maybe y'all can have it. 
Because they have nowhere else to go. They know that God is not about to change his mind and let them back into heaven. Because while they were there in heaven, they were part of the angels who sang that great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. They know that whatever God does stands forever. So the moment he said, you are out of here, they were out of there. But you know the little hope that they have is because they think of us as mortals. So even though that which has been said has been said to hold forever, but what if these ones that are not forever cannot hold on to forever? Anyway, let's not get into that, but you understand what I mean. When Balaam or Balaam was introduced to us, Balaam has a very interesting name. I'm waiting for Dione to come back because I don't want her to miss this. When Balaam, okay, well, she can watch the tape. When Balaam was introduced to us, he was introduced to us as a terrible man. In fact, when you look at the meaning of his name, his name, I'm going to tell you in just a minute. Let me, let me lay some more premise. Balak wanted to destroy the people of God because of the promise that they carried. Because he knew that he could not destroy their God and that he could not refute his word. Because he said over and over again, the kings of the other nations that they have passed through have suffered a defeat. So this method of theirs, this God of theirs is guaranteed to deliver. And so the only thing that I can do is to take out the ones that he wants to deliver for. The devil knows that he cannot change God's mind concerning you. That God has loved you with an everlasting love and that he has foreknown you and predestined you and called you and justified you and glorified you. Everything concerning you is sealed and settled because the Bible says God has perfected all that concerns you. No degree of misbehavior can make God change his mind about you because he is no respecter of persons. So all of your shady personalities don't bother him. <laughs> The only thing that bothers God is if you allow all of your inconsistencies and all of your frailties to now make you begin to doubt not yourself, but himself. You know, because sometimes you can study for an exam and be feeling like you got this. And then you go into the exam and the exam got you. You know what that does to you? It begins to erode your confidence. You begin to doubt yourself. Many things have happened in the past, or many things do happen to us. You know, when you were, when most of us were children, we totally believed that we could do anything. We thought most of our dads were supermen and they could do anything. But then as you grow older and you can see the man for who he really is, they begin to have mercy on him. You see yourself for who you really are and then you begin to dream less and aspire less because you don't want to keep disappointing yourself. But no matter what happens, we should never allow ourselves to doubt who God is. And that is the angle that the enemy is working. The enemy is working the angle of removing us because he cannot remove God. Of deleting us because he cannot delete the word of God. And that is the reason why Jesus said all of what he said. And at the end of the day, he says, it is only the ones who overcome that will inherit the promise. Because the promise is not going anywhere. You just need to persevere. You just need to stay till the end. Do you know that even if Abraham and Sarah had stopped believing, Isaac would have come anyway? <laughs> because if Sarah, if, if, if Abraham did not believe, Isaac could have come of the Holy Ghost like Jesus did. If neither of them believed, Isaac could have come like Melchizedek. Melchizedek showed up on this planet without father, without mother. The Bible says, blessed is Melchizedek, high priest forever, the one who had no father, who had no mother, who had no beginning of days, no end of time. And so God does not need anybody, but because of love, he wants everybody. He wants you to be a participant in what he has already done. Because it is more fun if other people come to enjoy it with you. 
Where did you get that idea from? Because that is God's nature. God likes to enjoy things with us. You understand what I mean? And so we have the responsibility of making sure that we're not allowed to be, that we don't allow ourselves to be driven out of God's plan. So now the awning is back. So I'm going to tell you all the meaning of Balaam. The word Balaam literally means one that is not of us. It comes from the ancient, from the joint age of two ancient wars, Ba. So when you say Ba, it means no. A lot of people who, who, who have been exposed to Eastern, I mean, uh, Middle Eastern religion and culture, you know that when they want to say no, they say ba, 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 which is no. And then, and then the word am means nation. So literally, in the English language, when you say I am, interestingly, you know what it sounds like in Hebrew? It means the nation of ruined people. So that's the reason why sometimes we have to be careful not to just be in the English language, but to also be in the spirit. And I've been saying this a lot lately because the Lord will help us. There is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there in the divination against Israel. They can keep planning, but the Lord is with us because the word I means a heap of ruins. A-I means a heap of ruins. And the word am means nation. So a nation of ruined people. But story for another day. Am means a nation or a people. Baal means not. So the meaning of Baal means, or Balaam means not one of us. Hmm. What have I been telling you about some of the actors in the world today? Some of the players on the political landscape. In the, in the area of business, some of the CEOs that we see on television, they are not people. And someone is like, okay, well, how does that affect me? What does that mean? What that means is that God is giving you an opportunity to see beyond the ordinary. He's calling you to come up higher. We are raised to think that everything is just mundane. Everything is just natural. And God is like, no, 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 no. You're a spirit being who is having a human experience. And we have come to the point of transition. And I need you all to begin to wake up. Every time God is taking his people through an exodus, he creates an avenue for heaven to come to earth, for angels to walk on the earth as men. Every single time, angels come and walk on the earth as men. When Lot was to be taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah with his family, there were two angels who came and they were angels of the Lord, but they looked like men, so manly that they wanted to have sex with them, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. If they were looking like angels, people would be like, yeah, I'll pass. But they looked like men and they said it. They said, you see the two men who are good looking, who have come into your house, send them to us. They said they were men. They assessed them. In the time of Noah, it wasn't just Noah. There were angelic presences on the earth, both of the rebellion and also of the evangelical. The ones who came to testify of what the mercy of God was offering to humanity, another chance. And so if every time we have seen a transition like that, there's been a mix of men and angels upon the earth, then why should this situation or this particular time that we're in be different? Will God still be a fair God if a generation experiences angelic visitation and another doesn't? We all do in all of our generations. Every generation ends and another one begins. And that is the reason why we're always preaching that the Lord is coming because the Lord is coming means the end is coming. And every generation ends. And so it's not just an old time religion. It is the most valid message that anybody can ever preach. Look at the messages that Jesus preached. Most of his messages were about the kingdom heaven, of heaven that was coming. And so when you begin to wake up to the reality that God is up to something and that angels are on television today in movies and next door to some of you all, then you begin to appreciate how much your heavenly father is doing to ensure that you do not miss the boss. Why did God introduce Balaam into the scene? Numbers 24. Balaam was a man who had been deemed evil. He was deemed a sorcerer. 
He walked around with his oracle. He was a diviner. He would cast his lot and he would divine what the spirits are saying. That was the way they conceived of him. In fact, he was a sorcerer for hire. Balak or Balak went to hire him to curse the people of God. But the reality of it was from his name, we knew or we now know that he wasn't actually one of us. He wasn't human. He wasn't of the nations. His name means not, not one of us. Not of our kind. He was not an am. He was not an, a people. He was an implant for an assignment. And you see those implants? Be careful because one day they are completely devious and the other day they are prophesying. <laughs> The Bible says, now when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. His assignment changed just like that. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. He was a terrorist. Suddenly, his assignment changed. He became the promoter of prophets. Cyrus was a tyrant. And one day, his assignment changed, and he was a sponsor to, of, the, of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Egypt was a land that was known to devour his inhabitants. But the Lord God Almighty says, out of Egypt I've called my son. When Jesus was being sought out by the Romans, that they may destroy him, by Herod, that he may destroy him, where did God send Jesus to go and hide? The Bible says the angel of the Lord Gabriel appeared to Joseph and said, you shall take the woman and the child and take them into the land of Egypt that he might be fulfilled, that out of Egypt I have called my son. God looked at Egypt and he says, oh, my beloved, I love Egypt. And sometimes we get confused. We're like, God, can you just make up your mind? Are they enemies or are they friends? And the Lord was like, it depends on what class you're in. It depends on what stage you're in. Everything works for me. Remember, never forget. The Bible says, all the glory, honor, and power belong to him who has created all things for his pleasure. They are and were created. When Jesus' ministry was about to begin, who were the major participants in the forging of Jesus' ministry, in the launching of Jesus' ministry? The Holy Spirit and Satan. After John the Baptist anoint, I mean, I mean, baptized Jesus in water, and the, and the father spoke. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. What he was saying was, remember what we practiced about 2,000 years ago with Job? Satan was like, oh, with Job. Job, my beloved. Oh, I remember. God was like, remember what we practiced. The moment I told you that he was my beloved, what did you do? You tested him to prove that he's truly my beloved. Not just because I say so, but because he believes it. Do you understand the way it works? God has done everything for you, but he needs you to also receive it. So he makes it happen. He presents it, but you have to engage by believing against all odds. But you haven't got faith when your belief is not tested. And so when God said to Satan, oh, have you considered my servant Job, how there is none like him upon the earth? God was saying, oh, this is Job, and I am pleased with him. And Satan was like, so what do I do now? God was like, well, man, you know what to do. He was like, I'll be right back. And he went and he tested him. And at the end of the day, the man came out fine as gold. They have had that practice time and time again. When Jacob was looking at Joseph and he was like, oh, this one is special. I'm going to make him a coat of many colors. His brothers were like, you said? And they went and tested him, sold him into slavery. How did he come out in the end? As gold. And so when Jesus was presented to the world by the heavenly father, saying, this is my beloved son, Satan was like, say no more. I know what to do. The Bible says Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, not just to fast, not to be tempted with hunger. The Bible did not even say that he was tested with hunger. The Bible says he was led by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that you love so dearly. Led Jesus into the wilderness to go and meet Satan. So the Holy Spirit took him into the wilderness and was like, 
Lucy, over to you. And Satan was like, whoa, let's go. Because everything works for God. And you're like, why didn't they teach us this when we were growing up? Was it because they didn't want to scare us? No, because they don't want you to know. Because when you know these things, after a while, you start to see through all of them. The moment they show up in the news, they're like, you cannot fool me. I know you. You are. You're just putting on the cloak of a man. You can deceive those guys. I'll see you later. You understand what I mean? Because you, but, but now we need to know. Because the Bible says that we cannot be ignorant. In fact, God says, do not be ignorant of the devices of the adversary, of the devil. You cannot be ignorant. God wants you to know. And that is the reason why Balaam was introduced to us as one that is not of our kind. Just so that we know that God uses such agents every now and again and they are the quickest to switch because of the fact that these guys are spirits on assignment and they can just change overnight. They can be the same people that are oppressing you and tormenting you. Do you now see how it makes sense when God said to us a couple of months ago that the time is coming wherein we would have to obey the king even though the religious order is telling us to just wait for Jesus to come and take us away. Jeremiah says, do not listen to the prophets who say to you that the time is coming wherein Israel will be taken from here to a place of safety. He says, do not listen to them because they are false prophets. What you must do is you must obey the king. And do you know what king he was asking them to obey? A worldly king that was full of torment. But the reality is a lot of those wicked kings that we have seen have also turned out to be messengers of God. From Nebuchadnezzar to Cyrus. From Cyrus to what is the name of that king in the time of, 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 of Esther. Is his name Ahasuerus. People who said all of those people must die. And at the same time, he was the same one who came and said, well, if you can defend yourself, I'm just going to be an umpire. I won't stop you. Because of the fact that when the season changes, assignments change. Let's go back to Numbers 24. Now, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times. At other times, he went as a sorcerer. But the Bible says, let him who speak, speak as an oracle of God. Keep reading. Let's see what happens in, in verse 22. It says, and Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to the tribes. And the what? The Spirit of God came. He was not born again. He was a sorcerer. He was a man who worked all kinds of evil. He had a reputation that if you want to curse a people, find Balaam. So when Balak was threatened and all his advisors came and they told him of the exploits of the God of the nation of Israel, he went to the roller deck in his office and he was like, let's find a cursor. Let's find a sorcerer who does a lot of evil stuff. And Balaam's name came up. And they were like, you name whatever you want. We will pay you to destroy these people. And Balaam was like, bring it on. His donkey told him three times, do not go and curse these people. And Balaam was like, have you seen the kind of check that Balak wants to cut me? Which is what a lot of us do. The Holy Spirit is telling you, do not take, take that job. And you're like, have you seen the salary that they are offering? The Lord says, don't go on that vacation. And you're telling the Holy Spirit, have you seen those beach photo, photos? I mean, photos or pictures? I can't even say photos. How do you say photos? Photos, photos. Have you seen the color of the ocean in that place? Well, Holy Spirit, you can stay here. I'm going. And that was what was happening to Balaam. He was so intent because he was plain. He was in character. He was staying in character as an evil man. Suddenly, 
He recognized that, oh, okay, the season has changed. It has pleased the Lord now to bless these people so I can no longer be in the capacity of one who curses them. Holy Ghost, I wish you heard what I just said. When it has pleased the Lord to set the captives free, the oppressors will like change from being oppressors to being supporters. Like when the season changed for Israel, the same slave masters who got them to work for free were the ones who gave them the gold to establish a nation. They gave them gold enough to start a treasury. They became overnight like a nation that has always been. And that was what God told Abraham. He said, I'm going to send your children into captivity in 400 years. No one will recognize them. He says, I will bless them indeed. And how did he bless them? He used the same oppressors to bless them. You see, this same system that has oppressed us, this same system, these same markets that have been designed to extort us is about to start to look for every way possible to favor us. Praise the Lord. And you have to be ready so that you do not run away from your blessing like our son Joshua ran away from the mascots. Remember the story of when it was his fourth year birthday and we took him to Chuck E. Cheese? Because we were new in the country, we didn't know any better. We asked some people, but we didn't know that they were of the order of Balaam. They were sorcerers. They told us to take our poor little boy to Chuck E. Cheese. And when those masquerades came out, or the mascots came out to entertain, he thought they had come to devour him. He screamed and yelled, and his pizza was falling off his mouth. We had to take him out of there. We paid for that. But because he didn't know that that was for him, he couldn't enjoy it. So this is the reason why we need to know that we have come to a time yet again. And so you know when I told you that Balaam is not one of us, he's, he's not human. He's actually there in scripture where he came from. Do you know that the name Bal Balaam in scripture was introduced as Balaam, the son of Beor. And B-R means the burning one. <laughs> B-R means the burning one. So Balaam was not one of us. He was of the, he's of the order of the seraphim. The seraphim are called the burning ones. They are the only kind of people that God would trust with such a sensitive assignment because he knows that he's about to do a quick work and he needs people who are as quick as fire. So he prepared Balaam, the son of Beor, so that when the time comes, the one that you thought was from hell. Because when you think about fire, you think of hell. The same one that is supposed to be the order of the illusion. The same, Rase. <laughs> ah, I almost want to say, Lord, let me go. Because there are certain people that have actually been identified to me. You know, the other day, one of them actually in the vision smiled at me. I'm like, oh, so you know that I see you. You see, these people, the same people that you thought were of hell and not of hell. It's just because we've been told that fire belongs in hell. Whereas, when you have fire that can produce, it is seraphim. Balaam was not one of us. Balaam was the son of Beor. Where is it? Ah, look at that. Praise God. He says, then he took up his article and said, the utterance. This is where it begins to get really amazing. Oh, I love this scripture. It says, the utterance of Balaam, the son of fire, the son of the burning ones, of the order of the burning ones, of the seraphim, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened. Now keep reading. It says, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. Where have you heard that before? 
the four living creatures. They have eyes that are open always. Even when they fell down to worship the Lord, their eyes were still open. The man who falls down with eyes wide open. We're talking about a man. When you read about men in the Bible who fell down because of the presence of the Lord, they did not open their eyes. The Bible says they fell to the ground as though they were dead. Peter, James, and John, when they fell at the Mount of Transfiguration, they fell as though they were dead. When John saw the angel of the Lord, he fell as though he was dead. When we, the, the list is endless of people who saw. But this one, he was in the presence of God. He fell down and his eyes were open. That's because he is not one of us. These are immortals. These are, he, he, he was supposed to be a vampire, but the reality was that he was an immortal. This guy, look at, look at the description of who he be, who he really is. But at the beginning, what, was, what were we told? That he was a sorcerer that took money to betray souls. Does that sound like politicians and businessmen today, the billionaires? A lot of these celebrities that we follow, we don't follow them, praise God, this is communion house. A lot of the celebrities that people follow, where do they make their money from? They make their money from luring souls away from life to death through music, through entertainment, through art, through fashion. They continue to make men slaves and harlots in the temple of God and money. If you don't know the God that I'm talking about is G-A-D and the money is M-E-N-I, is in Isaiah 65 verse 11, which, is, which are the two gods that are being worshipped in the world today, the God of plenty and the God of count. So they're always going, about, going after material things and they never get enough. That's what it means. You see, when you look at these people, they get paid to enchant others. Some of the highest paid people in the world today, what do they do? They're entertainers, including people who play sports. How much work do you do, Mr. Soccer Player? to be earning $10 million a week. Do you have four legs? And I'm sure you have only 24 hours in the day. But why do those people get paid so much money? They get paid so much money simply because their craft is an entrap entrapment for many. Their craft robs people of life. Those who are supposed to spend time seeking God and seeking to do the will of God. Those who are supposed to spend time understanding the reason why God placed them upon the earth. Those who are supposed to spend time looking for how to be a blessing in God's world and how to leave the earth better than they found it. Are busy sitting in front of that TV watching every game in the season. Just to be entertained. You are not watching those games so that you can be good at playing that game. You're not watching that game because you're learning a skill with which you're going to help to raise your children. You're simply watching it for your own pleasure. And so whatever you do that is for your own pleasure only is a black hole, is a waste. Because the Bible says it, that he that sows unto the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But the ones that sow into the spirit will reap eternal life. And so you find these movie stars and these musicians and all of and all what not sucking the soul of people away and they're getting paid for it that was Balaam Balaam was getting paid to enchant God's people but you know the word of the Lord came just before verse 20 chapter 24 in in numbers 23 23 and one of the reasons why this is happening today was the Lord came to me he visited me after Saturday meeting, you know on Saturday, the Lord kept saying to me, it's in numbers, it's in numbers. You know I kept saying it's in numbers, it's in numbers. Because what I was describing to you about the order of the angels who are doing the work of separation is in numbers. And so look at it in Numbers 23, 23, what, about, what does the word of God say? That there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now, somebody says now. 
It doesn't matter what has been happening before now. The Bible says it now must be said of Jacob and of Israel. Oh, what God has done. You see, before now, people haven't seen what God has done. Before the time Moses came to say, let my people go, no one saw what God did with Abraham. You look at the children of Israel, they looked like peasants. You look at them, they look like no, nobody. They didn't look like a nation. They looked like a godless people. But the moment the word of the Lord came, from that moment onwards, it became apparent that the Lord was with them. We may have looked like the bomb of the earth. We may have looked like we are lost in the world and we have lost the power of the Holy Spirit. We may look like it wasn't us that Jesus died for. Maybe those ones that have all gone to heaven and the rest of us are just excess programming. No, the Bible says that when the time comes, it will now be said of Jacob and of Israel. Oh, what God has done. It will be said of Jacob and of Israel. Meaning that it will be said of you, the individual, and it will be said collectively of the ecclesia. So you will begin to experience the Lord's goodness. And so when that time came, it marked the end of sorcery. It marked the end of divination. Do you know that Medea has ruled and reigned for long enough? You know, the, the Medea is the goddess of enchantment where we get the name media from. And that is the reason why all media is there to enchant and to sensitize, to make you believe in what is not, to make you think of what is not. But the Bible says a time would come and God would say, time up. So is the enchantress just going to turn around and go to heaven? The enchantress is already here and heaven needs a force. So what happens is everyone that has been in the ministry of sorcery will switch. The world is about to be crazy. But you already know what is going on. You will be having a ball. Some people will come to you. I told you already. The Lord took me a couple of months ago into the future. And I saw religious people coming to us and saying to us that we have lost our minds. They came to us and said to us, but during COVID, you people were saying this and saying that. So why are you doing this now? And we would say to them, because it's time for us to obey the king. Because that king is no longer who he was. Yesterday, he was a sorcerer. In chapter 22, he was a sorcerer. At the beginning of 23, he was still in sorcery. But towards the end of 23, there was a pronouncement that was made by God. That, okay, time up. End of sorcery. End of enchantment. Now, y'all change roles. And that is the reason why by the beginning of 24, the Bible says that Balaam was no longer who he was. He was no longer a sorcerer. He came out in his true form as one who was able to stand in the presence of the Almighty God. Do you know that you cannot stand in the presence of the Almighty God unless you have clean hands and a pure heart? The Bible says, who will stand before the presence of the Lord? Who will approach the throne of the Almighty? Only he who has a clean heart who has clean hands and a pure heart. Look at the man. Where is he? Balaam. The Bible says he has, he hears the words of God. A false witness is an abomination, but the one who hears will do what? Will speak expressly as an oracle of God. So there is Balaam. Let's keep reading. I think we need to get to verse 7 and 8. Let, but keep going. Go to verse 5. The Bible says in verse 5, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. Now he's beginning to prophesy, not about where they're at, but where they need to be, because at that particular point in time, they really didn't have any dwelling. They were nomads. This man was declaring what's going to happen when Jesus comes and he makes everything beautiful. And he makes everything new. This guy was talking about the settlements in Zion. Wherein the Bible says, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be upon the mountains. And he's... Children will dwell upon the mountains. So we're going to be neighbors, mountain to mountain. Let's keep going. Like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. He shall pour water, but it, it keeps going. Let me, there's a place that I'm taking you to. Maybe I need to navigate here myself. Thank you, Alan. So when I call it out, you can let me uh, bring it up there. So we are not taking too much time. 
So let's go to that number, same numbers to 24. Oh, I wanted to show you something in Numbers 23. I forgot, but thank God I remember now. In verse 1 of Numbers 23, the Bible says, Then Balaam said to Balak, Build seven altars for me here, and prepare for me here seven bulls and seven rams. Hello? What have people been talking about lately? In the last couple of years, people have been talking about the seven pillars of civilization. Talk about the pillar of healthcare, the pillar of banking, the pillar of education. And when they look at all of the sectors that run the current known world, there are seven pillars. These seven pillars were built by the kings, by the corporations, by the aristocrats. They were built for the false prophet to be able to come to do his work. And that is the reason why do you know that all of these seven pillars that were built and all of the tools that were created, like the social media platforms, they were created by bright minds. They were created by kings, people who were not only smart, but people who knew how to conquer. So take, for example, someone like Bill Gates. Bill Gates isn't just smart. He's very king-minded because he was born of royalty. Remember that I believe he's the grandson of Frederick. You know, the guy who was essentially the one that founded the educational pillar. You know, that Carnegie and the other guy had the money, but it was Fred Gates who was the mastermind behind the education system. So the education system that we have today that is supposed to create workers and not thinkers was the creation of Frederick, the grandfather of Bill. And so when you think about it, these guys are kings, they're royalty. What they do is they conquer so the moment they identify potential, they go for it ruthlessly. They don't care who gets caught in the fire. We don't want a nation of thinkers. We want a nation of workers. And the way we're going to do it is create an academic system wherein we are told people what to think instead of enable them how to think. You understand what I mean? And so when you come from that lineage, you already are from your royalty. And so from, from early on, he thought as a king. When he identified potentials in people, diligent men, a lot of his products were not created by him, they were created by other people. We grew up celebrating Gates as the inventor of Microsoft DOS, but the reality of it was he bought it for cheap from a mastermind who created the DOS application. I didn't know this until I was really grown. When I was a teenager, I just thought Bill was, was kind of like a god thrown out of heaven. How, how do you do these things? But the reality of it is that he was not the diligent man. He was just the king. The Bible says, have you seen diligent men? They will stand before kings. So he surrounded himself by diligent men. They acquired corporation to the point where the government had to say to him that his ruthlessness was unprecedented. They had to stop him. Or at least they attempted to. But these are kings because what they do is the moment you begin to suspect that they are becoming tyrants or they're becoming too powerful, excuse my French, guess what happens? They change form. They set up another nation and put a flag that is different from this one, but they're still the one in control. Look at how many nations in the world that are essentially Great Britain, but they have a different name and a different flag, but they're still owned by the crown. You know, it's heartbreaking when you find out these things, but because God waited for us to mature to the point where we don't care about these things anymore before he started revealing it to us so that we're not heartbroken. You remember the day that I found out that when I ran from Microsoft to Apple, I thought I was getting away from Bill, but the reality of it was most of the Apple that I was running to also belonged to Bill. Many people don't even know even till now. Do you know how many people who did not even know that when Steve Jobs came back from his career suicide or, or death, whatever you want to call it, that he came back, he came back with ideas, but he had no money. He had to turn to Gates, and it was all divinely orchestrated by Gates through another man whose name I will not mention. Two of them, actually. He orchestrated for that man to be in such a difficult situation that we have no choice but to bring his golden child to the man who has the gold coins. And so when they came to Bill, he was like, oops, I'm sorry. You, you said what? And then he, he essentially bankrolled the new Apple that you have today. And look at me, I was getting away from Microsoft. And I got into Apple and I was like, yay, I'm free from the bill. And then when my eyes were open, I was like, mm, maybe not. Hello, Bill. Good to see you here too. 
But the reality of it is that these guys are kings and they created these tools, these platforms, the mobile phone and all of those things because the first prophet was coming behind and he needed all of the seven pillars to be operational, healthcare, education, entertainment, military. All of these things had already been prepared. These were the seven pillars, the seven bulls and the seven cows. And the reason why, because I asked the Holy Spirit, I'm like, why, why, why bulls? And, and, and why rams? And it was like, it had to be economic. Because if, it's, if it has nothing to do with the economy, people don't care as long as people can eat. Because when you see the bulls, it represents economy. Look at the time of Pharaoh, the seven bulls that were fat and the ones that were thin. They represented how the economy will grow and how the economy will shrink, putting a strain on the people. Because the moment there is an economic collapse, what happens to the people is they become a slave to the system. When, when, when the famine hit in Egypt, what happened was the Egyptians, they saved food because they heard the prophecy of Joseph. Right? Remember the story. The Egyptians themselves were privileged to information. So they saved food. And when the time came for them to go and bring out the food that they had saved, it turned out to be that the weevils had gone into every one of their storage places and devoured what they saved which is what's going on with the pension system today. A lot of what people have saved in the stock market, in the pension schemes, no longer have any value because the weevils have devoured them. If you think that you are safe outside of Christ, newsflash, you're not. Because only he can save. So every one of those Egyptians, they created for themselves a landing pad for when the time of famine. And when famine came, the Bible says that they went to their storehouses and all of their Grains had been consumed by weevils. Don't ask where the weevils came from. We, we know. Because as soon as they noticed that they had no food, where did they go? They went to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was like, don't come to me. Go to Joseph. And Joseph was like, well, the, ma the boss says to sell this thing to you. I'm sorry, I'm just following orders. And guess what happened? The Bible says that the Egyptians came and they started buying food from Joseph until they ran out of money. And after they ran out of money, they had a protest. And what was the protest about? They all brought themselves to Pharaoh and said to Pharaoh, you have taken all of our money and we have no grain. And behold, we are still hungry. From now on, we shall be your slaves. Which is the ultimate goal. They want to enslave everybody. And so when you look at these things, these things have happened before. Solomon said there is nothing new under the heavens. Nothing what is, is what has been, and what will be, is what is. And so when we look into the past, we see the same actors. In fact, they're not even, their names may sound different because we're speaking different languages. The moment you know the meaning of those names, you're like, oh my God. Because remember that Joseph was not the real king. Pharaoh was the king, but nobody saw Pharaoh. You know, we have a king now whose name is Joseph. What? Sometimes the word Joseph, some people just call it Joe. I'm sorry, I had to spell it out. Joseph had Pharaoh. Joe had somebody. But all those things are for your benefit so that you know what to do. So where is all this taking us? Come with me to Numbers chapter 24. And we're just going to read verse 26. Not verse 26. Um, not 26. Hold on. Numbers 24. We got to verse 7, right? Yes, verse 8. It says... God brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. He shall consume the nations, his enemies. He shall break their bones and pierce them with his arrows. Let me tell you something, folks. The reason why all of these things have been set up is because the Lord wants to bring us out of Egypt so that he can gather us into his barn. But he's not going to do that until he has taken care of the wicked. All of what is going on is the work of angels 
and it is going on for your sake so that you know that the harvest has begun. And the ultimate goal of this harvest is to first of all remove the tears. But who is doing all of the work? God is doing all of the work. And what he wants you and I to do is to be still and see his salvation. Ultimately, God is saying, I want you to be calm, at peace, confident in me. Don't let any economic strain alter your character. Don't become easily irritated. Don't become frustrated to the point where you will curse with your mouth. Do not join the horde of those who complain. No matter how much strain comes at this time, it is not against you, it is for you. Because I have declared that the season of sorcery and enchantment is over. The time to favor Zion has come. Yea, the set time. <laughs> However, the reality of it is this. That final push by the army of Pharaoh will bring so much fear that people would rather jump in the sea and perish. It will bring so much fear. And God is saying that is exactly what I do not want for you or from you. I want you to be confident in the God of your salvation. Simply because God's looking for the beacon of hope to recognize his children. The Bible says the Lord knows the ones who put their trust in him. So basically, if you don't put your trust in him, he don't know you. So I want to encourage you folks, now that you know the privilege that you have, now that you are aware of all of what your heavenly father has set up for your sake, because what did Balaam do at the end of the day? Not only did he bless Israel, he also prophesied into their future. And he was speaking as an intercessor right from the presence of God. The higher or the mightier the opposition, the more powerful they are and the better positioned they will be to help you. And so I want to encourage you when we see the stakes go up, when we see the storm blow harder, we will not be troubled because these things have come to take us to the other side. The Bible says he, talking about Jacob and Israel, will go out of Egypt and he will behold the judgment of God upon his enemies. I stand here today by the grace of God to let you know that the earth is being judged, the weekend is being judged because the word they are also is the same word that stands for fierce judgment. That word is an ambiguous word. It has two very distinct meanings. It means the burning one, or it means to be burning, but it also means fierce judgment. The fierce judgment of the Lord has come, and that is the reason why he recruited people like Joe. But I tell you what, folks, it is now left for you to shake yourself from the dung hill. Remove from you mindsets of shame. Remove from yourself mindsets of the beggarly elements of this world. And once again, begin to say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Begin to open your mouth to speak life. The Bible says, be still and you shall see the salvation of the Lord. Whenever your heart is about to panic, just say, I will not leave my place. I will see the salvation of the Lord. One more thing that the Lord has instructed me to share with you today is that you have to open that mouth. Because when the kingdom comes, it comes through the mouth. The Bible says the kingdom of God is now with men and it is in their mouths. You know, I was doing a study recently and I found, only recently, that the word for word in Hebrew is exactly the same word for a thing. And it's the word dabar. D-A-B-A-R. Dabar. So when you say, I am speaking a word, it is the same thing as I am doing a thing. 
You can go home and look into your Bibles. If you have a phone that can download stuff from the internet, download Blue Letter Bible, and you look at the lexicon, and what you will find, not the lexicon, you look at the concordance, and you will find in the Hebrew language that the word word is the word dabar, and the word thing is the word dabar. So which means, as far as God is concerned, the words that you speak, they are as good as the things that you seek. The Bible says all things were made by the word. So basically what that is in Hebrew is all Dabar was made by Dabar. So basically you just need Dabar. You need the word. So you need to speak what you want as opposed to speaking against what you don't want. Remember, the word Dabar means a thing. It doesn't mean nothing. Dabar is affirmative, is positive. And so that means that the one who has equipped you to speak did not equip you to speak negativity. So don't say, Lord, oh, I don't want to suffer. Lord, I don't want pain. No, because all the I don't, I don't, I don't, they do not exist. Because the man of God, Solomon, what did he say? He says, the Lord did not make death. Death is the absence of life. So why do you want to speak negativity when you can just speak what you want? It takes less effort to say, Lord, I want health. And prosperity. Because you are just saying your position, your desire, and what you desire. There's no negativity. So don't complain about what you don't want. Just speak what you want. Because we are come to the Red Sea. And everything that we say from here onwards, it counts. Everybody who complained... The Bible says of all the people who came out of Egypt, all of them who came out of Egypt, we are made to believe that there are about 3 million of them who came out of Egypt. Do you know how many of them made it into the promised land? Only two, not 2 million, but just one, two. Joshua and Caleb. Why? Because they did not speak guile. They only spoke what they want. They never said, oh, we're afraid of the giants. They said, no, we're able to take the land. You understand what I mean? So God is faithful. He will take you out of Egypt. But will you make it into the promised land? The power of life and death are in the tongue. It is up to you and I. Remember when 2020, January 2020, before COVID came, the Lord said to us that the disease was coming. And it was going to be an epidemic of fear that it would be in the news. And he said to me, tell each and every one of them. That was after I anointed everybody with oil. He said, tell them to find a scripture for their family to preserve their hearts from failing out of fear. He just said one scripture. The, the, the Lord did not say, you have plenty of time. Because he told us that we would not be able to go out. January 11th. 2020, he said, the time is coming wherein we would not even be able to meet at church, nor go to places where we want to go to. So what did we know? We knew we were going to have time, but he just said to us, one scripture, I just need one word. Because God wants you to speak life when a transition is in progress. So we're going to go ahead and break bread right now, and I'm going to show you something from Psalms 15, very quickly, verse 7, and that's going to be our breaking bread scripture today. Good to see you, Pedro. It's been a minute. Thank God you're here. Praise God, praise God. Awesome, awesome. All righty. And Justin, thanks for inviting Andrea. Is it Andrea? Yes, God is good. Good to see you here too. So Psalms 15 verse 7, it is our custom here at Communion House to break bread with a scripture because we're not just breaking bread out of ceremony because Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this, what, in remembrance of me. And Jesus is the word. And so when we're breaking bread, we always want to remember one more thing that has been said concerning us. So, Psalm, not 15, 7, is Psalm 17, 5. It says, uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. It says, uphold what? My steps in your paths. This exodus that is upon us. 
is designed to take us to a place that has been prepared by God himself. The mountain of the Lord that is upon the mountains, according to Isaiah chapter 2, one of the very first scriptures that God gave to us in 2018 as we launched Communion House. But how do you get to the promised land? How do you get to the place that your heavenly father has prepared for you? You need to be able to climb that mountain. The Lord has given his word. He says, going forth, no more enchantment against you. No one's going to rubbish you. They won't be able to stop you. If anything at all, they will pay for your fare to get to the foot of the mountain. But when you get to the foot of the mountain, it's up to you to climb upon your high places. And so how do you make sure that you get to this mountain in Zion that is your new habitation? Remember that Balaam says that they will come to a place that the gardens thereof are planted by God himself. Jesus told John in Revelation, he says, y'all will be in a city whose maker and builder is God. Not a system that is made by Nimrod and his descendants. We're talking about a nation, a new world that is built by God himself as he originally intended for us to live, heaven on earth. But how do you get to that mountain? You have to climb. So in order for your feet not to sleep, you need to be grounded. In, you need to have the Lord uphold your steps. You need to be grounded. So my charge to you today is this. Make contact with the word. The word of God is the anchor for your soul. The Bible says that the Lord has strengthened my feet like a deer's feet. That particular word deer is not just talking about the ones that run in the back of your houses. Is the original word is the mountain goat. And you know how the mountain goat can climb up a vertical wall. The Lord's word can do that for you. By his word, he enables your feet, your hooves to be like that of a mountain goat so that you do not slip. But you have to encounter and engage the word. Have a revelation of what God has said concerning you. Search scriptures daily. Search daily. Just be looking back and forth. Because the Bible says some search the scriptures because in it they believe that they have eternal life, which is true. But you even have a mandate to go beyond just believing that you have life everlasting, that you will find for yourself anchor for your soul today. So Father, I'm in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to encourage us to stand up if we can. And just say, Lord, I thank you because this appointment has become an encounter. Because your word has stood before me and I am standing humbly before your word. Your word of truth, the revelation of Jesus Christ, upon which the ecclesia has been built. This privilege will not leave me the same. Father, by your Holy Spirit, let me experience such instant transformation like that of Balaam. It doesn't matter who I have been, it is now important who I become. I may have been a follower of the sorcery of the world, I may have been thinking of losses in my mind, I may have been Losing hope and losing faith. But Lord, I may have been losing hope. But Lord, by faith, I stand before you today. To say, Lord, if Balaam was able to change that quickly, so can I. Because I am made in your image and in your likeness. And I am what you say I am. I receive my transformation. I become one who is able to engage your word with insight and understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. You may now eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. This is the greatest privilege of all to have the life of Christ in us. You may eat. And as you drink, declare over yourself that that word will uphold me, even the word of the Lord. My feet will not slip. My mind will not stumble. My gaze will not shift from the mark of the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus.
is calling me to come up. That's what the upward calling means. And I will not miss the mark in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive the life of God. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's be seated quickly one minute and just give God praise. We thank God for another visitation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Another time of encounter before the Lord. Alrighty. Praise God for these brave soldiers here who have stayed till the very end. Um, it is what we do, especially as we see the day approaching. We seize every opportunity to receive that which the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. How many people feel more empowered today? Yeah. Better equipped. Praise the Lord. God is good. And I just want to say thank you. Chris is going to come up here for the announcements and possibly the offering too. But I just want to say very quickly that um, when we do the word of God, we cannot lose. And when the word of the Lord came forth for people to give sacrificially to the work that has been done in here, some have responded and when I've seen the offerings, I have known as a witness that these offerings are sacrificial. You understand what I mean? I want to say thank you for your confidence in the word of the Lord that's come forth. You know who you are. You will not lose your reward. And I want to encourage others who may have just heard that word and not done anything about it. I want you to think, it, think about it this way. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. Those of us that God has given the opportunity to shoulder responsibility directly for the work, we know that those contributions will be a big blessing and a great help to us. But more than that, it will be a bigger blessing to you, the one who gives. I want you to avail yourself of the opportunity to respond to such a call. You know, it is not our manner to talk about these things. It is more our manner to come and enjoy fellowship. But these things have to be said also. And honor must be given to whom honor is due. I celebrate the ones who have risen to the occasion. God bless you. You will by no means lose your reward. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, let's celebrate Chris. Come on. God is good. That was an on-time word. Uh, if you'll make your uh, eyes uh, towards the screen here for the given details, we've got... Um, you can find us at Communion House, uh, Dollar Sign Communion House, Cash App, and then the Zelle details and PayPal details are there. Brother Kenyatta has the, uh, the basket for anybody that has uh, any envelopes or anything there. All right, so now, um, if everybody will close their eyes. Very quickly, I want to, I want to say this. There is um, a need for you to start decoding things differently. You know, the Bible says, you are in this world, but you are not of this world. One of the things that we have been told is that democracy is a government of the people, by the people. And when it stopped being of the people, and in a number of ways, in a number of places, without mentioning countries, when it stopped being for the people, many believers were too asleep to know. But it's okay. Because what Balaam literally means, like I told you, is not of the people. So I want you to repent from having had an expectation of the sorcerer to deliver blessing before the Lord has spoken. Many of us are disappointed in the system because you thought that it was of the people, but you didn't know that the real name of the actors, their real name is Balaam, not of the people. And as we started to see that maybe they're not for us, why are they saying that? Why are they allowing this? We were getting hurt and disappointed inside. Hear me now, communion house, and our friends who will be watching afterwards. This is the voice of him crying in the wilderness, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Release them. Do not hold a grudge. Do not harbor disappointment or resentment. And do not speak guile. Because the same ones who are not 
of the people are about to be revealed as agents of light for the people by God. Because if God be for you, no one can be against you. But that window is still open for us to repent from dead works. They may not have been of the people, but they're about to be for the people by God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. That was awesome. Yeah, we needed to hear that. So, as I said, the given details are on the screen. So now let's, uh, let's bless these uh, tithes and uh, offerings. So if you will, for me, uh, close your eyes. Um, Father God, we just thank you for bringing us into this house and into your house, Lord, and allowing us to just receive this timely word. We ask that you bless these tithes and offerings and may them, they be precious and most holy in, in, in your name and allow them to build your kingdom and just allow us to continue to grow and just bring more believers to you and your word, Father. Thank you for all you're doing and all you've done. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So now we make our ways to the announcements. So we've got, uh, coming up Wednesday, we've got our second watch, uh, which is at 9 p.m. Uh, on our Instagram, which is at Communion House on Instagram. I definitely want to be there for that live at 9 p.m., and then we're at it again on Saturday for our teaching um, at 6.30 p.m. So uh, looking to see everybody there for that. All right? God is good. Thank you. God is good. Let's celebrate our dear brother Chris. Amen. I'm not going to hold this. I'm going to continue to encourage us. If you haven't tapped into that prayer yet on Wednesday, please do. Okay? It's been so revelatory, and we need it, especially with this level of word that we're receiving. Amen? God is good. Father, we give you praise for this time of meeting. Yet again, where you have met with us, we have encountered you. We have heard your word plainly. We give you praise for the grace that you have placed upon this house, the vision that you make plain for before us, O oh God, that we may run with it. We thank you for traveling mercies as we go back to our homes, carrying this presence with us. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said amen and amen. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's have a blessed night.